Welcome back to the most accurate podcast here at 4 for 4 Football. As always, I'm your host, John Daigle, and it is a very special day here at 4 for 4 because friend in life, you, John Paulson, we've teased it over the weeks, but they are finally here. The 2023 projections for fantasy football are ready to go. Yes, we were hoping to release Monday, but we had a couple of Site hiccups, but we got it all ironed out, and uh, they are now up and ready for consumption. Uh, a lot of red meat to talk about, to chew on uh, today, so let's get going. And we will have more than enough time to dive into the tiers and microanalysis of every player here, but at first glance, from last night to showtime, I've been taking notes over some big picture takeaways, especially as I continue to build out the shells for my team previews, my best ball tiers coming out of the sites, and also we know T.G. Hernandez will have his best ball analysis coming out soon too, and that's what we're going to talk about today, Paulson. But quickly, before we begin, I want to give everyone a chance to get in on the fun, because if you are listening today... What you are about to hear in previewing Paulson's projections, some best ball analysis, it's all available on the site. And if you don't have a sub yet, we want to give you that opportunity. So for the next week, by the time we record together next time, Paulson, next Wednesday, 12.30 p. Eastern, I'm giving everyone seven days to leave a comment either on this episode of our YouTube channel or on the podcast feed, The Most Accurate Podcast. And then we will sift through the comments we will fight through everyone's words, and we will pick the best one to give a free sub to at the end of the day. So for the next seven days, it is on you to get your comments in for a chance to see everything we are about to discuss. And I want to begin, Paulson, with the big three quarterbacks, because that's really the overarching strategy everyone's taking in drafts early in best ball. Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes in that order average at least 24 and a half points per game last year. And you have none projected for 21 per game. Now I want to say, I agree with you. I've been trying to find a way to phrase it correctly because it's always felt like as those three players currently going as top 20 picks on underdog, it's genuinely felt like the tax has gotten too much, but I couldn't find a way to put it. And then I see your projections and then I also see that since 2013, the last 10 years, only nine other quarterbacks have averaged at least 24 points per game. And then we can look and see that Joe Burrow last year, the QB4 in points per game, was more in line with that overall QB4 scoring. Um, averaged just 1.1 more points per game in that decade time span than the other QB4s in that span. And so actually, Paulson, I think what your projections – and what regression analysis, analysis is telling us that maybe this tax on these top three quarterbacks is a little too high this year. Well, I would first say that uh, the points per game uh, calculations that you did there might be a little off because mm -hmm. I don't uh, assume 17 games played for any player other than maybe a kicker. So I, I did a big draft study and – determined what the average running back, average uh, receiver, average quarterback, average tight end. And then I tweak their projections to fall in line with the number of expected games played. So for, for a quarterback, expe I'm expecting 15.6 uh, games played. That's what we've seen on average uh, when I did my draft uh, study. So what that works out to, and you're still, you're still right because nobody is projected for over 24 uh, fantasy points, but for example, Jalen Hurts is uh, projected when you divide by 15.6 games, he's projected for about 22.8. So I do expect with these guys a little bit of a regression, um, you know, and that typically happens with a player has a great, great season, things downgrade a little bit. They are, um, you know, the, the, the way that the NFL is moving, uh, the last couple of seasons have been offensively more of a challenge. Uh, for, for the league as a whole than it was during the COVID year when there was no crowds in the, uh, in the arenas and the, in the stadium. So this year, when we did these equation, equation updates, we're just looking at the last two seasons, crowds were back. And uh, I think we have a better picture, apples to apples picture here in all the uh, multivariable regression that we do for the, uh, for the equation. So to answer your question, maybe a little bit shorter than I already have, 
I don't know if the tax is higher or low. I I look at these three as, uh, you know, the top three. I have them in a sl- slightly different order than what Underdog has. Underdog has Mahomes going first, Hurts going second, and Josh Allen going third. I think you can't really go wrong with any of these guys. In the middle of the second round, that is a little pricey. But what I saw, you know, what I'm seeing as a whole with the quarterback position is that after the top eight, it's really a free-for-all in terms of who's quarterback nine through 17 or nine through 20. Like those quarterback two, low-end quarterback one, quarterback two ranks are all over the place depending on which analyst you're looking at, which ADP you're looking at. Uh, because there's lots of different different people with different different opinions. So you might want to grab one of these top eight guys and kind of build your roster around that sort of construction. That means with Trevor Lawrence going last, 60 pick, 61.5, you're probably going to have to uh, grab a quarterback uh, in the first five rounds. And that's kind of different than what we've been preaching for years and years and years with the late round value quarterback strategy. And you can still do that but you really have to be sold on one of these guys going in the QB two ranks. I will also note that I cite points per game because I don't think games projected for me anyways matters in that case. Like citing points per game is also then stating you're ignoring starts because you're citing the points per game finish, as opposed to like talking about, Jalen Hurts being the overall QB1 last year, for example, then that starts taking into account games played since a player may have scored more points per game. This is just regular fantasy analysis, by the way. Since a player may have more, scored more points per game than Jalen Hurts, but they only played seven or eight games. Uh, so that's why also I just don't use finishes either. I just go straight to points per game if we're talking about overall uh, projections for all this. You did mention, though, the quarterbacks after QB8 – And I want to get right down to QB 10 because it's a big debate on underdog right now as the QB 10 through 12 between Anthony Richardson, Dak Prescott, and a few others, uh, Tua Tagovailoa, Deshaun Watson, all included. What's important, though, I think for your projections is that you have Anthony Richardson as your QB 11 and you have Dak Prescott as the QB 17. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on why lower than current consensus on Dak Prescott. Well, I actually have him at QB 16, but you're, I'm splitting hairs. I mean, he is lower there than the average at underdog QB 11. Um, it's nothing that's really wrong with Dak. I, I mean, there is a change in the uh, offensive coordinator there with Mike McCarthy coming in. Uh, we don't really know. I mean, the, the offense was so good under Kel- Kellen Moore, and I don't know that it's going to be able to maintain that or take a step forward with McCarthy. Uh, we don't really know what McCarthy wants to do. We, we think we know because of his last couple of years at Green Bay, but I would warn folks that Aaron Rodgers was overriding his play calls left and right. There was some talk here with McCarthy wanting to come in and run the ball more, but they were actually fairly run heavy last year uh, compared to uh, the league. Um, I'm pulling up the pass splits uh, right now uh, for Kellen Moore. Um, I don't have it real handy, but as I remember it, it was not, well, it wasn't like they were super, super pass heavy. So if McCarthy wants to run the ball even more, I think that's going to downgrade the, the passing attack in general. I think Dak's fine. Um, I think the, the 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 luster is off of him at least from a oh he's going to finish in the top five top eight standpoint he's more of a low end QB one for me now uh, with potential with upside. Like when I project out rookies pre draft, since we're really just trying to check as many boxes as possible. That's what I do this time of year with all of these players heading into their new situations on offense. And I actually love this time of year because I think you really can't have player takes until you have team takes and overall offense takes. And what I can tell you in terms of why I agree with you, not so much as QB 17, but on being lower on deck Prescott this year than consensus is that prior to last year, only 15 teams had scored a touchdown on 70% of their red zone possessions in the last decade. And not only did Literally none of those teams 
15 teams repeat that touchdown rate inside the 20 the following year, they also averaged a drop-off of 15%. So for reference, last year's Cowboys punched it in at a 70% rate on the red zone possessions, but a 15% dip would have taken them from top two all the way down to league average. That's a massive difference. And so if I'm expecting these big picture numbers to regress, then I also think the Cowboys offense regresses. So from that standpoint, I do agree with you. I am lower on Dak than everyone else seems to have him in that QB 10 range as well. Yeah, I think it's all, like I said, when you get out of the top eight quarterbacks, it's all over the place as to what, I think there is an agreement that Anthony Richardson has a ton of upside. So he's one that could move into that nine spot for me if reports out of camp are that he's ahead of what we are expecting as a passer. Uh, Because I think he's fallen into a great situation uh, with the uh, uh, Stain Station, uh, the former offensive coordinator for the Eagles who – has coached a running quarterback, knows how to deal with them. I think he's probably going to use Richardson in the same manner that he used Jalen Hurts. Now, I think Jalen Hurts came into the league with a better passing profile than what Richardson has Mm -hmm. in terms of his numbers. But Richardson is a very good deep ball thrower. So if if that can, if the short stuff can improve, and it sounds like he's got good, I already saw one positive that he's got good uh, pocket presence better than expected then if his passing numbers get to where, you know, I've got him at, um, you know, in 15 and a half games or so, I've got him about 3,000 passing yards, 16 touchdowns. That's not much. You know, his fantasy value is being driven by those those rushing yards, 827 and 6.9 touchdowns. But if, if those passing yards can get into the 32, 3,300, and he's going to approach 20 passing touchdowns, then he's going to be a, a big threat for the top five. And logically, if you are lower on deck, it probably means you're higher on someone else. And right now, we are seeing in the projections on the site, Geno Smith as your QB 10, currently being drafted as the QB 16 on underdog, although everyone is liking his double stacks between Metcalf, Jackson Smith and Jigba, and Tyler Lockett in that order right now in terms of ADP. So explain to us how you came to that conclusion on Seattle's passing offense. Yeah, I, I think the, you know, his ADP is at QB 16. Mm-hmm. So I think drafters are just not buying his QB six finish last year. I guess that's what's happening. Like this was an aberration. Um, I could see that thinking to a certain degree, but he did flash the year before as the starter spot starter for the Seahawks and did just as well as he did last year. And he does run the ball. Uh, 366 yards and a touchdown uh, on the ground last year. QB6 finish, and now they're adding the, the top consensus rookie receiver to the mix. So if there is an injury to Lockett or to Metcalf, the, the offense can weather that storm a little bit better. We're also adding him now to three receiver sets, an explosive option. So to me, yes, he's probably he probably overplayed a little bit last year, but not to the point where we're going to put him at QB 16 and he's a mid range QB two. I mean, I think he's a low end QB one. I think that's what his expectation should be with these three really, really good receivers. They also have Noah Fant and Will Disley at uh, tight end. They added another really good pass catching, uh, just running, good running back in general. So this, this offense has, has got a lot of weapons and I think Smith's going to be the, the, the spoke, you know, the central, Uh, I guess, the spoke for for all that. As Monty notes in the chat, maybe it is because of recency bias. Uh, Recall last year that Geno Smith had 11 turnovers over the second half of the season. Some of that was because the offensive line was injured in that span, but I do think a lot of it was just being his first full season as a starter and the ups and downs. It's like being a fantasy analyst false for the first time. We all remember we were just trying to figure this thing out and get through the grind of a 17-game season. Uh, It's tough out there, so of course it took some learning reps and some experience, but Yes, I want to be higher on the Seahawks offense as well. And we've talked about this in the past, so I won't go into it too much. But just a reminder for everyone, since you also have Lockett projected basically in the range that everyone is instead taking Jackson Smith and Jigba around wide receiver 30, 
just remind everyone that Metcalf and Lockett have played 32 games together the past two years. And not only has Lockett averaged more fantasy points per game than Metcalf, 12 and a half to 11 and a half in those 32 contests, but he also has five top five finishes as the better spike week option than Metcalf's one in that span. So Lockett, again, perpetually, forever, is yet again a value in 2023. I want to talk about a player I find to be a sleeper this year, and it's ugly when we first discuss him. But after Matthew Stafford, your QB 20, was being drafted as the QB 12 in ADP last year, I think it's time to buy back in on him and the Rams passing attack as crazy as that sounds. Because remember in 2021, he averaged his third most points per game and also did that around the Rams leading the league with an 80% passing touchdown rate, an insane number. And so Stafford then regressed as we expected last year to a career low in points per game. So that regression we think is now out of the way, but everyone is still double discounting him this year. And this is for a team that right now, I don't know if you've seen it, Paulson, but literally 58% of this roster is rookies. You can't name another defender outside of Aaron Donald. And so what that tells me at least is there's going to be a ton of volume to go around because they're just not going to compete at all. And so I want all of that opportunity soaked up with this passing attack. Yeah, I think my primary concern, I mean, I have him at QB 20, uh, his ADP, I believe is QB 22. So I'm actually like, I wasn't looking at that as I was doing my rankings, but it looks like I'm slightly high on him. I, you know, it's typically a good offense. Uh, if he gets Cooper Cup back, it's a whole nother. I mean, he is getting him back, so it's a whole other you know bag of beans when it comes to Stafford with with Cup in the lineup. Um, I think the one concern here, well, there's a few concerns, but the number one concern is that you got Cooper Cup as your wide receiver one, then you're looking at Van Jefferson, Tutu Atwell, uh, Ben Ben Squarenek, uh, Lance McCutcheon. Uh, you're so, looking at Tyler Higby is what you're looking at. You yeah, so I was actually going to I was actually going to mention mention him because Higby really came in pretty high uh, in the projections because of I think he's the number two option in that passing attack and he's going fairly late in drafts. So I think he's a really good uh, tight end sleeper. Uh, good chance at t- uh, tight end one numbers for him in terms of uh, the floor for his targets. Um, yeah, I mean I wouldn't run out and draft Stafford, but if you're you know looking for QB two in best ball. Uh, He's not a bad he's not a bad option, and I think you just want to hope that his he stays healthy. And uh, you're a little bit concerned about his overall health, but uh, at this point, he's coming back into an offense and and should regress in a positive manner to back towards what he was doing prior to that uh, injury prior to last season. I don't think we're going to reach the same heights though, and that's that's maybe the the reason he's going so late. Cooper Cup, as you mentioned, your wide receiver two overall. And I completely agree in the same tier as Jamar Chase and Tyree Kill. Remember that in the six games Cup played with Stafford last year, he did go over 100 yards in five of six and averaged double digit targets in those contests. So, again, recency bias also pushing down Cup, making him a value so far. Another receiver in the top that is currently being debated among a lot of people at the end of the first round is Devontae Adams, usually being drafted around 10 or 11 ADP in the back of the first round, you have him as your overall wide receiver five. And my only concern is that after leading the league, all wide receivers in both targets and touchdowns, 20 yards downfield, we also know over the last three years, Garoppolo, unlike Carr, hasn't even reached double digit percentage of his targets thrown deep. And so I'm curious And I question if the deep volume will even be there for Adams to maintain ceiling performances. So go ahead and give us your thoughts on Adams in this offense. Well, I think there's, I think you could make the case that he could be a couple spots lower. Uh, I don't think higher is, you know, much of an option given the four Mm -hmm. that are ahead of him. Uh, I, I think my concern with him is the, the quarterback change going from Derek Carr, you know, somebody he had played with before now to Garoppolo. And I think you're underlining some, you know, understandable concerns, but he is still, I think, you know, I look at Diggs at seven. Okay. Maybe Diggs should be uh, higher uh, than, than Adams lamb. I don't know that I would, I'm ready to put lamb over Devonte Adams uh, just from a talent and production history standpoint. So, you know, six or seven uh, seems legitimate. Um, so you're saying that the, the Garoppolo's downfield 
targets aren't matching what Devonte has seen in years past. I still think he's the central cog in this machine. He's going mm-hmm. to see a boatload of targets. Um, I guess there is, you know, some argument with, uh, you know, how, how heavily Carr targeted him. Will Jimmy still, you know, give him that same share of, of targets? And you know, who do we have at receiver now for for Vegas? Uh, Jacoby Myers, is, yeah, Jacoby Myers is in, so that you know could cause an issue for Devontae, a small issue. But Waller is out, so you've got a rookie tight end, uh, Michael Mayer or Austin Hooper at tight end. You know, I still think he sees a lot of targets based on what I'm looking at here on the depth chart. So I still have some confidence in him. Maybe maybe you go digs over him, but I don't know about Lamb. And to your point, Adams was the only receiver in the league last year that accounted for 30% of his own team's targets. So maybe that wasn't a Derek Carr thing. Maybe that was an offensive scheme thing. We'll see how much it matters that Josh McDaniels brought in his own guys for better or worse. But when we talk about nitpicking and you say maybe Stephon Diggs, I actually want to be higher on A.J. Brown than Devontae Adams. Uh, remember, the Eagles trailed for a league low 19% of their second half plays because they faced the league's easiest strength of schedule last year. And that's why Jalen Hurts also only averaged 11 pass attempts in the second half per game, as opposed to 19 and a half attempts in the first half, a whopping difference. And so now that based on Vegas win totals, the Eagles are projected against a league average schedule, 16th strength of schedule. That tells me that I think they're going to have more competition. And so pushing the guys into more volume through the air in the second half should lead to even more fantasy production and less duds because they're forced to be into competitive games. Yeah. And I saw, you know, you had AJ Brown wide receiver eight on the show sheet ahead of Jalen, Jalen Waddle, Amon Ross St. Brown and Garrett Wilson. I thought I was getting ready to defend that because I don't always it, fight you. I agree with you sometimes. <laughs> Uh, because yeah, he was wide receiver four last year, right behind, uh, Devante and Tyreek and Justin Jefferson. And I think, you know, you, you, you put Cooper, Cooper cup back into the mix. I think he likely finishes ahead of Brown. So, you know, you're looking at maybe a ceiling of, of wide receiver five for Brown. So I think wide receiver eight is a good, is a pretty good ranking. Um, he did score, you know, almost two fantasy points per game, less than Devante. Uh, but you know there is the there is that safe like the, the safe feeling you get when you are drafting a highly productive receiver who has a returning quarterback. You have that um, familiarity and, and cohesiveness already built in, as opposed to how will Garoppolo do with with Devonte or how will this new quarterback do with this new stud receiver? It does add a level of uncertainty to the to the the pick, and maybe you do. Maybe you do go with uh, with Brown over Devontae in that situation for safety. A receiver you're on the opposite end of the spectrum on in terms of where he's being drafted right now is DJ Moore. Currently on underdog as the wide receiver 21. Currently in your projections as more of a mid to low end wide receiver three as the overall wide receiver 32. In a tier of players, I'll let everyone go and look at the projections for because I believe you're correct around Jordan Addison, Brandon Cooks, and a handful of other will be considered to be secondary options. So go ahead and give us your spiel on DJ Moore and why you're lower on him than the rest of the field. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to right now the projection for Justin Fields is 2,580 yards Mm -hmm. passing with 18 touchdowns, and that's obviously – very low compared to, you know, league average quarterback play. Uh, you know, it works out to about 165 yards passing per game. He averaged 149 passing yards per game and 1.13 touchdowns uh, per game last year. So, you know, what I'm looking for in order to start bumping up the Bears passing game is, you know, reports coming out of camp that they are not going to run him. 11 plus times a game. I mean, this might hurt his fantasy value if they don't run him as much, but it would certainly help DJ Moore's, uh, Cole Komet, uh, Darnell Mooney's fantasy value. If, if the bears are throwing for over 200 yards per game. And right now I don't expect that based on what they did 
last season. So, you know, he, he didn't, he never threw for more than 28. He never threw more than 28 times and he only went over 200 yards twice. So the, the passing volume just isn't there. So that, that's why DJ Moore lands at 31. Now, if, 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 if we hear that the, the bears are going to be more balanced, they're going to throw the ball more and he's likely to get over 200 yards passing per game, then that's obviously going to add uh fancy points for all those receivers. I agree with you. And I think the answer either way would be just to draft Justin Fields. If only because I do expect their passing volume to increase. If only because they obviously can't average 21.9 pass attempts per game again. Like not only was that the fewest in the 21st century, that's the first time an offense has averaged less than 23 attempts per game since the 1979 Chiefs. Like logically, statistically, it just can't happen again. So we're expecting more passing volume. But how much more is the question? So maybe it just results in rather than nitpicking between Cole Komet, who's being egregiously overdrafted for basically just having four touchdowns in three weeks. Uh, and then of course, between DJ Moore, Darnell Mooney's a secondary option. Maybe the answer is just ignore all the guys and instead just take the rushing floor with passing boom weeks and Justin Fields moving on to running backs. Josh Jacobs is currently ranked as your RB two being drafted as the RB five and underdog. And I think it's an interesting question because after a league high, 393 touches last year. We don't think he'll achieve that number again, if only because five running backs, that's it, have registered 390 plus touches in a single season over the last decade. But not only that, the last four before Jacobs to do so, and again, very small sample, which is why I teeter back and forth on it. Uh, Christian McCaffrey had 70, 76 touches and then got injured after three games. Derrick Henry, his one season he was injured, with that foot injury, eight games, 237 touches. DeMarco Murray, remember, had that big year. The Cowboys let him walk. Chip Kelly signed him. And then he responded with only 237 touches across 15 games. And then, of course, we had the Le'Veon Bell holdout, which then forced him to skip a season. But he returned in 2019 with only 311 touches. So at least by this small sample, there's a lot of things that can happen. So... Your explanation then on Josh Jacobs in that range ahead of the field. Yeah. I mean, I have him at 320 touches uh, mm-hmm. after a bigger significantly you know, less. Yeah. yeah. A bigger season last year, but uh, all these running backs, uh, you know, are not, as I mentioned earlier, are not projected for 17 games. So yeah. uh, that's part of it. But uh, I think you look at the depth chart there, what they did in the off season, there just isn't any competition for him. And I just expect more of the same from, uh, from the Raiders in terms of how they use Jack Jacobs. So I guess the argument against him is he's going to get injured. And I found it really hard to uh, predict injuries in the past. I think we have a certain, you know, understanding that the older the player is, uh, the more likely he is to miss a game or two just from old age, body breaking down type stuff. Jacobs mm-hmm. is still uh, young. Uh, he's still in his prime, and I think they'll continue to ride him. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to downgrade him significantly, expecting him to get injured because he's coming off of a big uh, touch season last year. I mean, I may it may backfire, but I think right now, you know, because I have Derek, Derek Henry pretty high uh, as well. I think they're both really good uh, values there. I think they're going what in the in the second round early third round uh for these guys uh, jacobs is going pick 27 henry going pick 26 um i think those are really good values for the, the types of workloads that they saw last year and are likely to see this year you do have derrick henry as a top five player and he's not going as that uh is that basically the reasoning is because you think he's again a workhorse as they you know add tajay spears but we've talked about in the past I, i'm very worried about spears as even short-term outlook yeah, I mean, I think uh, Henry is just one of these guys that, you know, last year I heard the same. I mean, when I say you have, when you said I have Henry a top five player, you're talking about top five, five player. Top five running back, yes. Running back, okay. Uh, you know, I heard all the same things. You know, he's he's 28, now he's 29. Uh, he, you know, had huge workloads in the last few years. The foot's breaking down. He ends up playing 16 games, setting a career high in uh, catches with 33. Uh, so they're getting him the ball in different ways. They didn't add anything really in the passing game. So I think he's going to continue to see, uh, you know, maybe two catches a game uh, and, and raise that fantasy floor. 
And he's just one of these guys that's built different. He's bigger than everyone. He's the one laying the hits, not getting hits laid on him. I, you know, maybe something like his foot injury pops up again, but again, I don't want to heavily discount running backs until they get to 30. Uh, so I, I still think Henry, you know, as one of the two players who has averaged at least 20 touches per game over the last two seasons, the other being Jonathan Taylor, he's one of these few workhorse backs uh, in an age where the bell cow back is falling by the wayside. So I, I still like him. And you, you know, you look at these, all these top seven or eight players and you can, there's a little, you know, you can pick some nits with, uh, with all these guys in terms of, uh, you know, Austin Eckler's contract situation, Bajan Robinson being a rookie playing for the Falcons, uh, Chubb, do we think that he can uh, advance in the passing game as much as we'd love? I mean, I love Nick Chubb as a runner, but is he going to mm-hmm. take over uh, Kareem Hunt's uh, passing down role? Uh, Tony Pollard, can he hold up to a uh, 300 plus type season? So, you know, there's these, these guys are all great, but none of them are just no brainers like uh, maybe Christian McCaffrey. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the running back two through 10 is an interesting conversation as well this year. I'm glad you mentioned that because if you go to my underdog rankings, everyone can find on the site. Hover your cursor over the rankings, go to underdog rankings, and I adjust your projections plus my projected surges and dips in ADP. Since drafting for tournament isn't really blanket statement rankings you're drafting from. You're trying to be ahead of the pack. I have Joe Mixon and Miles Sanders and Najee Harris ahead of Travis Etienne. Your RB18 currently the RB12 in ADP, and it really does, in my opinion, shape up as one of the bigger letdown seasons in the last few years. Um, Even thinking back to Najee Harris's letdown that we discussed all last offseason. Because remember, without James Robinson for week eight on, Etienne had the volume. He was 11th in routes run among all running backs in that span, but was unable to earn targets. More than three targets in just one of those 12 games without Robinson and recorded a double-digit target share and only one as well, playoffs included. And so... I honestly think when people think of Travis Etienne, they are thinking of Mixon or Miles Sanders instead. Your thoughts on Etienne and that ranking? Yeah, I agree with that. You know, having him lower, I think the you, you brought up the span week eighteen on, so week eight to week seventeen, uh, he scored one hundred thirteen half PPR, twelve point six points per game, and that was fifteenth uh, at the position. So mm-hmm. having him at the in the top ten or top twelve doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. The The receptions were not there despite all those routes run, you know, that now they added Calvin Ridley as more target competition. Uh, Evan Engram's back. Uh, so it doesn't look like ETN is like primed to have a big pass catching season or role. And they added, uh, you know, Deer- Dearness Johnson, who's, you know, flying way under the radar as a pretty talented runner out of Cleveland that they signed in free agency and uh, tank Biz- Bigsby, the rookie coming in to perhaps take some of the load off of uh, ETN in terms of his carries. I don't think they want to run him 20 plus times per game. So uh, it just looks like a little bit of a disappointing letdown season based on where he's going uh, in early drafts. And I cited the pass guessing usage, not only because ETN's was piss poor, but because Tank Bidsby had a career 15.4% target share in the SEC for his career. Like, that's what he does best is earn targets and probably better than ETN right now. So that's why I'm concerned about ETN as well. Finally, before we get out of here, I think we've teased the projections. We've shown everyone what you've been in the cave handling the past few weeks. I want to end with a couple of your values. I know you're seeing one quarterback in particular you want to talk about and any other position you'd like to get into. Yeah, I, yeah, I wrote up the uh, rankings breakdown. So what's going to come out this week uh, on the site? Uh, quarterbacks are already up. So you can 2023 fantasy football rankings breakdown quarterbacks. Basically outlining, I look at the position as a whole and try to outline what I'm seeing in terms of positional depth, uh, guys that are jumping out as being overdrafted, underdrafted, et cetera. And one player that, you know, just to talk about how the sausage was made a little bit, Sam Howell came in in the initial projections, came in at quarterback 11. So I had to downgrade that some because we made I it, not, we made it to tinker with that a bit, but yes, I like Sam Howell too. I, the, the issue with him, and I actually reached out to Matthew Barry via DM and, 
not to humble brag or anything, but he, you know, responded to me, gave me, cause he's a, he's a commander's fan and gave me what his, you know, his thoughts are, were on the situation. And his only concern is my you know concern as well, is that they don't stick with Howell. If he struggles a little bit at the start of the year, uh, Ron Rivera might be on the hot seat uh, and they might switch gears to Jacoby Brissett, who we know can manage games. However, Sam Howell can really, really, really run the ball. My uh, r- rookie uh, quarterback model, which does okay when it comes to projecting passing, you know, giving me a starting point for pass projections, yards per attempt, completion percentage, et cetera. The one thing it does really, really well is project uh, rushing yards based on a player's college rushing production. And it expects uh, 35 yards per game from Howell. And obviously you're going to get some touchdowns from that as well. So when you have that kind of rushing floor and can throw the ball pretty well, I, I looked at his, all those throws from that game against Dallas and they didn't, they, they were ahead the whole game and he didn't, he only, I think attempted 19 passes, but he threw a couple of nice deep balls. He was pretty accurate. Uh, McLaurin had a drop uh, and he had one really bad interception in the, uh, in the red zone, but he threw a touchdown and he rushed for a touchdown. And I think, uh, you know, he's not a redraft QB one probably, mm-hmm. but you know, if you're in these best ball, leagues and you want to do a two or three quarterback build i think he's a no-brainer once the number of quarterbacks off the board gets into that mid-20s because he's going quarterback 30 and i haven't projected a quarterback 19 and i do think that the system the projection system likes him even more if he gets 16 17 starts he could he could flirt with high end qb2 low low end qb1 numbers that's going to be up to him and throwing accurate balls and not screwing up the game but uh, he has that sort of upside. I think he's sort of uh, arbitrage for uh, Anthony Richardson. Uh, similar type profile in terms of being able to run the ball uh, with the, also the ability to throw it. We also have Eric Bieniemy approved offensive line, both through the market and the draft. And then, of course, in adding Chris Rodriguez on day three, although they said they had a third round grade on him, I still think a day three running back means either Brian Robinson or Antonio Gibson is an off season winner. I'm still trying to figure out which one, even though the answer is probably never Gibson. So we'll eventually get there. Uh, Your projections again, live on the site for anyone, for everyone. What else do you have coming out this week and next week to compliment them? Well, I have i I'm going to do the rankings breakdown for running backs, receivers, and tight ends. I'm hoping to get them all out by the end of this weekend uh we do have a question in the chat from monte i don't know if you want to to maybe take this gibbs going either too high or way too high i'll, I'll just give my little spiel i've got him at rb 15 but i don't feel super confident about that i think both he and montgomery though are really good values in that offense with montgomery taking over the jamal williams role and perhaps gibbs being a you know deandre swift type that can actually stay healthy uh, and catch a lot of passes. I think you were looking for Gibbs to be a very, very high in the pass uh, projections. I think he ended up fifth or sixth I, most. I, be- I believe you have six receptions. most receptions. And what I guesstimated before you got them done is that Gibbs would be top three. Uh, so somewhere around there, around four, I think Ramondre Stevenson also has an argument, is where I have Gibbs coming in. But the way best ball works now, there is no right permanent answer like david montgomery is a buy right now based on adp because he's dipped to like adp 90 plus and so that's the player i take right now and eventually i think we'll get some training camp news that pushes gibbs down and then i'll take gibbs and that's just the way the world works now during the offseason yeah i just sorted the the projections by receptions and i've got eckler mccaffrey stevenson and i had jarek mckinnon at four so that's something worth discussing maybe on a future pod but he's back in kansas city uh, I would assume he's going. You no, know, he's maybe not, not going to catch them as many touchdowns, but I would assume he's going to be in that same role that he was second half of the season last year, where it's him and Pacheco and and uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is just you know the caddy for those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mixon at five, so that's he's another contentious back in terms of ADP versus uh, projections, and then Barkley at six ahead of Gibbs. So. You know, and Barkley has his projection for 52, and so is Gibbs. So, you know, they're both about at six. So, you know, I think certainly a case. And if we hear, you know, Gibbs is 
being peppered with targets in training camp, then it just takes a, you know, a little tweak of the projections and he's up in the, in the five spot at least. And remember, we are giving you this one chance for the next seven days to get it all for free this year. Leave a comment on either this show on YouTube, 4 for 4 YouTube channel, or the most accurate podcast feed, and we will pick the best one next week and let you know. So until then, look for that projections on the back end. Look for my best ball tiers coming out with the rest of our best ball content, including TJ Hernandez best ball mania breakdown. Also Sam Hopkins deep dives. Very excited about that next week. And until then, you know, be a little bit kinder than what's required. We'll see you next time.